Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Taiwan's new southbound policy. And joining us via Skype from Taipei, Taiwan, is Ms. Natalie Tso, uh, who is an award-winning uh, radio host and producer, and who, at the present moment, hosts a show on uh, Radio Taiwan International. So welcome, Natalie. It's great to have you with us. It's great to be here, Bill. Great, great. Well, um, Radio Taiwan International, a lot of our viewers uh, might not be familiar with uh, RTI. So could you give us um, an idea of what it's all about and what its mission is and that kind of thing? Well, it's basically the um, national radio station of Taiwan, similar to Voice of America. Mm -hmm. We broadcast in 13 languages, and um, we've been here since 1928. We're going on our 90th anniversary. So it actually started in Nanjing, when, when the ROC was in China. And uh, they took you know, the radio station wherever they went throughout the war. Um, but they brought it to Taiwan, and now, it, it, in the past, it was used more for political and propaganda during the war. But now we host a variety of programs. On English, we have you know, music, culture, uh, food, uh, politics. I have a, a program about China, a program about Taiwan. Um, and we have a variety of, votes, of hosts who do all kinds of uh, interesting programs um, in English, and then we have them in uh, 12 other languages. So it's um, a modern day you know, international uh, radio station. We broadcast on a shortwave, medium wave, and also on the internet. Wow, that's a pretty sophisticated operation. And while I was in Taiwan, I was lucky enough to uh, have Natalie invite me onto her show. So I know that the facility is a very nice one. Well, um, let's get to the nitty gritty here. Um, Taiwan's new southbound policy, what's that all about? Well, I, you know, it's basically um, President Tsai Ing-wen is trying to diversify Taiwan's uh, economic trade because it doesn't want to, she doesn't want to rely that much on China, which, you know, uh, about 20% of Taiwan's trade is with China, and um, about 13% is with uh, Southeast Asian nations. So basically, because uh, China has not been so friendly to Taiwan, um, President Tsai is trying to, you know, find other economic partners. So she's working with um, the governments in Southeast Asia, also five countries in South Asia, also Australia, New Zealand. These are the target countries of the new southbound policy. So the government's subsidizing, um, you know, investments there. They're increasing um, trade as much as possible. Trade has increased since the beginning of this policy. Um, increasing tourism, which has also increased. Um, trying to uh, promote more cultural exchanges. Um, they're offering a lot of scholarships, about 60,000 to students from Southeast Asia. Mm. Um, we're also, we also have a lot of immigrants from Southeast Asia, mostly marriage immigrants and foreign workers. So Taiwan is also working to be a more friendly place for them. They've come, especially the marriage immigrants, over the past decade. I actually did a couple of documentaries um, you know, targeting uh, these stories about these mostly women who come here as wives to Taiwanese men. Um, I also did a documentary about the foreign workers and sometimes, um, you know, the challenges they face. Also, sometimes they even get trafficked, exploited, and things like that. And how Taiwan is working very hard to protect them and to help them. So, this is a whole new population actually in Taiwan that's um, becoming part of the society and especially their children are becoming, um, they're growing up, and the government wants to raise them to be a bridge, you know, to Southeast Asia. So they're offering um, now, you know, a lot of schools in elementary and junior high have Southeast Asian languages. Wow, that's so, amazing. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Um, in, in the past, Taiwan has tried this sort of thing um, during the Li Dongwei uh, era. And yes. it didn't work particularly well. Why should it work now? Well, you know, I think that um, these countries actually they're growing. They have a, a, a growth rate of about five to seven percent, um, and predicted growth rate over the next ten years. So I'm not. I don't know if it's how well it's going to work, but I think that it's um, it's something. It's 
it's broadening, you know, Taiwan's economic reach and reliance, you know, and expanding into different countries. Whether they can totally replace China is, is a totally different question. I mean, trade has increased maybe about 17% or so. I mean, there is definitely some amount of growth, but whether that can be enough to uh, face the challenges that, you know, China may is giving Taiwan, that's another question, mm. you know. I mean, China is pulling its tourists, it's squeezing Taiwan's international space, you know, they're not very happy with President Taiwan and how she does not recognize the 1992 consensus. Right, So right. this is the government's way of trying to find another way out, right? Well, you know, we it's interesting to, to me work in the end. That, that Taiwan was so dependent on Chinese tourists, and of course that was one of the, the leverages or one of the levers that uh, the mainland has been using against Taiwan, right? Well, we're going to reduce the number of mainland tourists and can go to Taiwan. But, it, you know, I think the way Taiwan responded was really interesting. They just liberalized all the, the visa laws for people from Southeast Asia and also for Korea. And, and now the overall number of tourists in Taiwan is actually higher than it was before. Right. There's a, um, a slight increase. So a lot of them are from Southeast Asia, actually. Right. So, so I mean, you know, her efforts, I think, have helped. We don't know, you know, China is such a major country, Ruby. we don't know how, how well this will hold out against uh, in the long term against China's policies. It's definitely, I mean, it's a positive direction, especially as, you know, Taiwan, like I said, they we have a growing population from Southeast Asia. Right. And um, many of them are now um, residents, you know, and, and new citizens. So uh, using um, this diversity um, in an economic um, sense, it makes a lot of sense. It seems that Taiwan, like a lot of like Japan, South Korea, uh, and, and China itself, has a bit of a demographic challenge in that um, the society is aging. And so there's a sort of a lack of younger people. But if you uh, open the doors of immigration from Southeast Asia to Taiwan, then it helps to, how should we say, balance out society. Uh, it does a little bit because uh, a lot of Taiwanese actually don't give birth to a lot of babies. We have a very low birth rate, around one. Um, whereas Southeast Asian uh, women are uh, more statistically, you know, liable to give birth to two, three, or more children. Mm. Uh, you know, that's just the way they are. So that actually, I guess, does help the population a bit. So solves the demographic oh. problem. Well, why is it that women in Taiwan don't seem to be too interested in having children these days? What, what was your question? Why? Well, uh, yeah, it seems that um, there's a sort of um, a relative lack of enthusiasm in Taiwan to have children. That's true. I um, actually did a report on that for, for Time Magazine. There's been some research into why. There's basically two reasons uh, people, you know, Young people or those who are able to have children um, are afraid to spend the money and the, the time, you know, mm. losing their freedom and losing their their money. Mm. It's very expensive to raise children, um, and it's a big responsibility. So some people don't want to. I have quite a few friends, uh, colleagues, who don't even want to get married because they've seen, you know, their friends get divorces or have affairs, and then I'm talking about women, um, and then some um, women or couples don't want to have children because it's too much trouble. And so as for the independent women, um, that's why there's so many new Southeast Asian women coming in. Mm. Because a lot of independent women who don't want to marry are well educated, they're financially independent, but that leaves a big gap for some men who are not as well educated. And so they go abroad to poor countries looking for women. And there was a, a whole industry that cropped up um, in the well, what, the what's decade. the divorce Actually, rate, industry. though, between um, uh, Taiwanese men and women from Southeast Asia? Is the, the divorce rate pretty consistent with the overall divorce rate in Taiwan, or is it higher, or is it lower? Or do, you, do you have any idea about that? Um, Taiwan's divorce rate is, is fairly high. I, the, I don't know the exact statistics, but what I do know, um, I mean, I think it's probably about the same or maybe a little bit higher. Um, a lot of these marriages um, are kind of based on economics. Yeah. You know, if they're going through a matchmaker, they probably don't even know each other. But because um, the women 
want a better life for themselves or maybe their families back home are very poor and they usually are able to get a nice uh, dowry or you know i mean they're, no they're able to get a nice sum of money for right. marrying right. um usually right. a man will give the family money either through a matchmaker or otherwise uh, they solve their economic problems a lot of times so the, a lot of the women i interviewed um a family of four sisters who married taiwanese men and hmm. The first lady went all, through all this matchmaking industry. All four of these industry. Vietnamese sisters married Taiwanese men. Four Vietnamese sisters, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and, Clean sweep. Um, she, they told me that she did it. She went through this you know, matchmaking uh, industry, uh, association where she was kind of like um, paraded you know, with all these other women, and the Taiwanese men would come in and just pick the one they liked. Mm. And when she got chosen, she said, at one point, she felt happy because she was chosen, but on the other end, and she felt like she was like a piece of meat, you know, mm. the way she's being treated, mm. and it was kind of humiliating. But the reason she went through this is because she really loved her parents, and they were very poor, extremely poor, and she knew that her doing this would help them financially. And in the beginning, her marriage worked out pretty well, but then later on, when her husband... Um, was unemployed, he started beating her, mm. and he beat her so bad that, you know, broke her rib, and, and she divorced him. She has a, a child, and she got custody of that child. But in the meanwhile, um, her other sisters all married Taiwanese men, and that was, you know, partly because in the beginning she said it was going well, and this totally resolved her, her parents' um, economic situation. They live in a really nice house, three-story house now in Vietnam, and so in the end of all, hearing all of their stories, I asked the first sister, do you think it was worth it, you know, for all that you've been through? She said, you know, it's worth it, because my parents, they're doing great now, you know, financially, and wow. we're not worried about them. You, so, you know, I, I, I think I, I missed something there. One of the sisters got divorced, but the other three stayed married, or they all four stayed uh, married? Uh, two got divorced. One was because of abuse, one was because of an affair, and two stayed married. I also talked to the other sisters um, that were married. Um, one of them, you know, the husband is a really nice guy. He kept on praising the sister mm. about how smart she is. She also learned Taiwanese. Um, mm. So some of these marriages work out quite well. I think it really depends on the man, I uh, think, because if they treat her well, you know, the woman usually is more traditional, willing to work hard and right. be a good wife. We're about to um, now, some men, here. because they use money um, to obtain this marriage may think that they own this woman and they treat her like a slave right. or a servant. Yeah. So Let me squeeze in this question well. just before we go to break. Um, the, the two women that got divorced, did they stay in Taiwan or go back to Vietnam? Stayed in Taiwan. Stayed yeah, in Taiwan. She, well, because she told me um, the wages are about 10 times higher. So mm. she was planning to stay here until she makes enough money. Her, she's raising her daughter. She works two or three jobs. And then they're going to move back to Vietnam. Wow. Eventually. wow. So, um, okay, I think we'll uh, take a break here. Um, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Ms. Natalie Tso, who is joining us uh, from Taipei, Taiwan, via Skype. We've been talking about um, Taiwan's new southbound policy, and uh, as an extension of that, the uh, immigration from Southeast Asia. Um, that uh, Taiwan has been experiencing and benefiting from. And we'll be right back, so don't go away. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii.
Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Ms. Natalie Tso, award-winning radio host and uh, producer. Uh, she's joining us from Taiwan via Skype. We've been talking about Taiwan's new southbound policy, and I, I think we've pretty well covered that. We're going to go on to some other topics now that uh, often are associated with Taiwan. And one is, I think, uh, unfortunately, um, that Taiwan gets slighted in the international news, but whenever there's a brawl or fisticuffs on the floor of the Li Fa Yuan, the legislature, that's sure to be spread all over the world almost instantly. So, Natalie, why is it that there's that Taiwan has this reputation of having a, um, a rather cantankerous legislature that's given the fisticuffs and, um, how should I say, general disorder. Is there any well, end to this? <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought it was very strange when I uh, watched them too. The reason they do that, and, and this has always been the case in the very beginning, is because it gets attention. I mean, you guys hear about it all the way in Hawaii. The <laughs> right, 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 attention right. of whoever you get exposure. wants to be on stage. So they will yell and fight and get on top of each other. And, you know, so that the media um, will report on it. And also they show their, you know, constituents that they are fighting for their, you know, uh, stances. So, you know, Taiwan's media is very sensational here. We have about seven 24-hour news stations. So they love, you know, coverage like this. But that it's become just a media show. Mm. People do it not because they they're that passionate about a particular issue, just because they want to get attention. And they do get the attention. And, and you're paying attention, right? <laughs> the world's <laughs> paying attention when Taiwan. Yeah. Does well, that. you know, um, sometimes in Taiwan, I, you know, I'm talking to people about this situation. And, and they would say, oh, you know, what will the foreigners think? You know, the, the white women, what kind of impression will they have? Well, to me, I caught in a way, I th sort of thought it was kind of cool because it's so much different than, than, than the past, the bad old days of authoritarianism. But on the other hand, it's getting kind of old. And, um, I, and, and I sort of, you know, trying to rationalize this, well, you know, young democracies, they go through these stages. Like when the U.S. started out, there was some pretty brutal fights on the floor of the U.S. Senate. In the um, 1950s, after World War II, when the Japanese diet was getting back on its feet, there was some pretty nasty fisticuffs that broke out there. And of course, Korea, uh, South Korea has had its fair share of this sort of thing. Although my understanding is that there's some pretty stringent laws now in place in South Korea. So if you are a member of the National Assembly and you're fighting on the floor of the National Assembly, you could be in some fairly serious trouble. And it seems that you probably know this better than I do, but Taiwan has similar laws, but they're never enforced. I think it's become part of the culture. You know, it's <laughs> become part of the way, the way they, things are done legislature, unfortunately. I mean, it, it is really embarrassing um, because, you know, a lot, the majority of the population is very well educated, is very right. polite, um, you know, but our legislature is given the brawls and crazy antics. You know, that's interesting that you say that because, you know, one of the ways in which Taiwan uh, garners international um, support, which is not obviously not easy for Taiwan to do, is because it's a democracy. However, when you see people attempting to hit others over the head with a chair, <laughs> that, that sort of diminishes the impact, the positive impact of that. And, and once in a while, I know people, you know, they get fairly seriously injured. And uh, sometimes security guards who try to break up these fights, they get injured. I mean, it's, it's pretty messy. Um, you know, on the other hand, how could people be upset about the sunflower movement occupying the legislature if all these legislators fight each other? It's true. I guess the students are learning from the uh, leaders, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the impact of negative example. Yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> I think my one is also, I mean, like you said, we're a young democracy, so mm -hmm. people are used to protesting. Right. Uh, protests all the time um, in front of the legislature, all kinds of groups, you know, 
these days the issues are pension reform, uh, the uh, labor reform, and all kinds of issues. Whenever there's issues, there's going to be all kinds of protests. Right. And I guess they're taking advantage uh, of freedom of speech and the media, free willing media that we have here. You know, uh, yeah. during my year at Academia Seneca, the Institute of Taiwan History, I did a lot of research on Taiwan uh, political polarization. And, um, you, you know, it said, you know, like if one looks at the, um, how should we say, the growth of Taiwan democracy and the different stages it's gone through, it's like a lot of people think that, well, and a lot of people in Taiwan, well, democracy is elections, or democracy is the ability, as you just suggested, to go out into the streets and riot. And, and Taiwan does both of those well, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. Um, but, but there's more to it than that. And I, my hope would be as time progresses that civil society will become more mature and, um, and, and Taiwan democracy will blossom more. I think it is, you know. Well, except for our legislature. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, now, um, you mentioned in an email that uh, according to different polling, expats really love Taiwan uh, as a place to live. And, but why is that? Well, you know, the number, I interview a lot of expats in, in my work. I do radio interviews uh, in English. And the first thing people say are the people. Uh, people here are really friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's very different than what you see in our legislature. I mean, they're extremely friendly, especially to foreigners. I, I wonder if you experienced that while you're here, Bill. Um, you know, they'll get, go out of their way to take you somewhere if you're lost or to accompany you or invite you to their homes. They're very hospitable, and, and they will take you to different sites. So they actually really enjoy having foreigners here. It's kind of like a, a, you're a special guest. So even mm. if you're a total stranger, you know, you can feel that people are excited that you're here and they're very friendly. So I think that's one thing that foreigners enjoy, that probably that's the friendliness or maybe the special treatments, you know, that people give them, that special honor and, and friendliness. I think also it's an easy place to live. Um, I mean, transportation and it's a very walkable, like Taipei is a very walkable city. Mm -hmm. Transportation is great, very clean, um, very inexpensive. The cost of living, um, except for the housing, is about half of the United States. So usually an expat salary will go a long way um, here. And uh, health care is also very good um, and very inexpensive. Right. So, and, and, and if they're getting a good package in terms of education, you know, the international schools here are good as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that expats, the food also is great. Um, and there are a lot of places to see. You know, there's a lot of hiking. There's hundreds of kilometers of cycling paths. There's a lot of beaches. So people like to get outdoors. There's a lot to see and do. Um, so I think that expats, because of their uh, resources, you know, they usually have a better salary than the local Taiwanese, much mm -hmm. better salary. So they enjoy life here a lot more. They're living in better homes. They have a lot more income. And everything here is a lot uh, less expensive than the United States. And then the people are very friendly. So. I think all these uh, factors make it a quite a friendly place for expats to live. Right, right. I, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, now, as a Chinese American, how is it living in Taiwan? Well, you know, I'm not on an expat package, so it's, it's different. Um, and the salaries here are not that high. I mean, a lot of people, local people, would, would a lot of them want to go abroad to work because they want to get higher salaries. Mm -hmm. um, as a Chinese American, I'm kind of in the middle, mm -hmm. you know between the local and expat in terms of like lifestyle and, and otherwise. So people are friendly. Um, and I like the uh, convenience, the walkability, the, that, that aspect of it, you know. It's easy and fun to get around, so easy to meet your friends in any part of the city and have things to do. Mm. So and it's become more and more international. Mm. You know, I've been here for 10 years, and it's, it's always uh, upgrading it's, uh, you know, transportation network. Um, I live in a nice part of town that's very easy to walk. And within my home, I could, there's like 10 convenience stores within a five minute walk, maybe 50 places to wow. eat, 50 places to shop, you know. So. Do, um, do people in Taiwan expect you as a Chinese American to act in a purely 
Taiwanese, Chinese way, or do they realize that you grew up in America and there might be some difference? Is... Oh, I think they realize there's a difference, especially because I, I mean, I speak Chinese fluently, but I still have an accent. Mm -hmm. I have an American accent, so they'll they'll notice it pretty right away, pretty much, and they'll ask me about it. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, they they understand that I grew up in a totally different environment and that I see things differently. But they're still very, you know, friendly. They, they're not like, why do you speak Chinese for funny? You know, <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> and usually if, if an American is willing to speak Chinese, they're very happy about that. They'll like, right. say, oh, your Chinese is so good. Yeah, I know. You, even if you say so, something really simple, oh, your Chinese is so good, yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's almost embarrassing, actually. <laughs> say, well, yeah, I studied Chinese a long time, and I still got a long ways to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, let's say a uh, hypothetical situation. We have a corporate executive who's about to, uh, who's being transferred to Taiwan. What kind of advice would you give them? About um, living in Taiwan, or? adjusting to Taiwan, that kind of thing. To do in Taiwan? Mm hmm. Well, there's, I, you know, I, there's so many things that um, I, I would, you know, it, encourage them to be adventurous, you know, about what they eat. Mm -hmm. uh, about the places they go, you know, don't be in their own little expat bubble. I mean, there's so many great uh, restaurants and places to eat and night markets to discover um, the local scene, to make some friends who are local, mm -hmm. um, and, and also to travel throughout Taiwan. There's all kinds of places, mountains and oceans, and um, you know, cycling is great to get outdoors. So there's a lot to do. A lot to see, and I would encourage them to be adventurous, and also to make friends of all different backgrounds, especially with some local people, mm. just to get to know them. I think they're, they're very friendly and nice people to be friends with. Mm. That, that's good advice. I would agree with that, and um, I, 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 I quite agree with you too about why uh, Taiwan is so popular with expats. Uh, and it, uh, yeah, uh, my own experience really coincides with a lot of what you said. Well, uh, we're getting down here close to the end, but um, let's um, let's take a minute or two to um, just briefly talk about Tsai Ing-wen's presidency. Um, what kind of grade would you give her? Oh well. <laughs> I've just been told we really have maybe, thirty seconds. Uh, How, what an unfair maybe, question maybe, to ask I right mean, at the end. I think it's very difficult to be the president of Taiwan. You're facing China, mm -hmm. and uh, you know China's relations have definitely gone have deteriorated since she's been in office. But mm -hmm. um, it's probably because you know you know she didn't want to recognize the 1992 consensus. So China has been taking away Taiwan's international space, tourism, and, and she's sticking to her principles on that. Um, she's also trying to uh, do some challenging reform on the local front, labor and pension, which she's definitely going to have people against you, people are losing out. So uh, these issues need to be tackled, but it's not easy. So. Um, I, I give her yeah, credit for uh, tackling some of the really difficult issues, personally. I, I mean, some of these issues were sort of kicked down the road by the uh, Kuomintang uh, during its era. Definitely, especially and, pension, right? Yeah. Um, it's very unreasonable on many fronts. Oh, this is the amount of pension that some of these governments are getting. And, and to take it away, though, of course they're going to be protests about it. Right. Labor is the same issue. I mean, look, wages are low, and she's trying to help the workers, but then now the businesses are going to be losing out. Right. And if they're not making profits, then, then what is it going to be? So right. it's definitely a difficult situation. Well, it looks like we're about out of time here. I really want to thank you for joining us today. And uh, I want to thank you uh, and our audience for uh, tuning in. And uh, we'll see you again next week when my guest will be retired U.S. Navy Captain uh, Carl Schuster who is a Hawaii Pacific University faculty member these days and also uh, still uh, works uh, as a government contractor doing uh, security analysis. We'll see you then.